Sometimes it's hard for us to see God. Sometimes in this world, maybe we feel his presence, but we have a difficulty seeing him, especially in the midst of hard circumstances that hit us with life. Be it a divorce, the separation of two married people or of our parents or, or even in our own marriages. Be it the death of a loved one, the loss of a job, we have a hard time sometimes seeing God in this world. I don't know about you, but I know that I've never heard the audible voice of God. I've never seen an angel with my own eyes. I don't talk to God face to face like I can talk with you. And that's not to say he's not there. The book of Esther is one of the more interesting books in the Bible, and, uh, and it's one of my favorites, but it does have one interesting thing, and perhaps you already know that the name of God is never mentioned in the book of Esther. But not only is his name never mentioned, neither does it ever talk about the temple or the law or morality. It's just a story, right? It's just a story. Our lives are just stories in many ways. And the question that we pose is, where is God? Where is he? And I think we find God very clearly in the book of Esther. In some ways, finding God in Esther for me is more powerful than reading about God because it's just like our lives. It's just like us. And we can find God in our lives. Even in the midst of trouble, God has a purpose and a plan. If you will, open with me to Esther chapter 1. Esther 1, we're going to go through the book uh, quickly. But uh, first, let me, let me set the stage for us. Right? The, we're about 2,500 years before the current day, before cell phones and electronics, before cars, before guns, before Facebook, right? For your teenagers, before algebra. Algebra hadn't been invented yet, so you could have skipped out on that one. <laughs> and we're in the Middle East, right? In the capital city, or a capital city of Susa, in the middle of a great Persian nation. And this Persian empire really stretched all the way from India across down into the heart of Africa and up and through into the footsteps of Europe. This kingdom was ruled by a man, a king, Xerxes. Perhaps uh, your Bible may say Azareus, which was another name for him, but uh, I'll refer to him as Xerxes, which is the more common name for him today. And this king, Xerxes, was a great and powerful ruler, and he ruled a vast nation. And we find him, perhaps, uh, perhaps you've watched the movie 300, Right? This is King Xerxes. He was fighting against the Greeks at the time. And, uh, and in the midst of fighting against the Greeks, if you've watched the movie, if you haven't, uh, it's a very violent movie, so I wouldn't recommend it for all. But uh, the, he was having some difficulties in Greek. And he won initially in, in some battles, but then found himself encountering a revolt and uh, Greek is a long way from Persia, right? So he was having difficulties controlling these people and ends up getting kicked out. And as he runs back to his capital city of Susa, they decide to throw a party. And this is not any normal party like you or I think of parties. This is a party for the whole nation. 
and we find out that it lasts 180 days, right? A half a year long party, right? So now we think about our government officials, they would throw themselves a party for a half a year without blinking, right? Well, probably what's happening is that they're taking shifts partying during these 180 days. So they're not all not working at the same time. But uh, they're taking their shifts and they're taking turns partying and uh, the king's partying along with them and displaying that even in the midst of a loss that he still controls power. He still maintains the power. He still has money. He still has great wealth, and he's showing it off. We read um, in the party, at the last seven days, they have the biggest party, right? The party to end all parties. And uh, the wine is provided freely. The entire city is invited to the party. Everybody in the city is invited, and the king is providing food for all. Everyone, as much as you can eat and as much as you can drink. Here it is. And, uh, and he is showing off his wealth. I mean, we read in the Bible it, that he had, he had on display a gold couch. And we read in history about these gold couches that the Persians had. Who in their right mind even wants a gold couch? Right? I much prefer the couch I have in my house, which only cost a few hundred dollars. Right? But he has on display a gold couch and it's set up on a pedestal on top of gems, and they're serving drinks and gold cups, and everybody's laughing and drinking and having a merry time. Well, then we, we read in verse 10, right, that the king, Xerxes, was merry with wine. Well, that's a polite way of saying that he was drunk, right? So, and in this drunken stupor, he calls to bring the queen, Queen Vashti, before him. Now, the ladies at this time, they're having their own party. And now we don't do it like that, right? We don't separate the men and women. That's common in this culture, even to today in the Middle East. The men and the women, they separate during parties. When I was invited, at, at, when I was living in Dallas, I was invited to break the fast with a group of Middle Easterners during the month of Ramadan. And this is a party, this is a celebration for them to break the fast each day. And it, as I walk in and I notice, there are no women here. And most of these men were married with children. No women, no children. So even in the midst of their, their partying, their festivities, which for them would be maybe roughly equivalent with a feast during Thanksgiving or Christmas, they don't do it with their family which seemed really odd to me. Yet uh, that's their culture. They separate themselves. And so the women are off partying on their own with their children, and the men are partying on the other side. So he, he calls for his wife, Vashti, the queen. And I think it's most likely that this is, uh, is that she was the daughter of of a great general and that her son was the one who was to be king. He was the prince. And um, she call, he calls for her and apparently she's very good looking and he says to come before the men wearing your crown. Well, I'm not a Hebrew scholar and I won't claim to be, but some Hebrew scholars uh, say that the ordering of these words, that it perhaps it means that he wanted her to come wearing only her royal crown. And um, I don't know, maybe, maybe not, but either way, for the queen to come in front of the men to show off her beauty, clothed or not, was a disgrace. This, was the, this is what you would call, you know, one of any of the maidens to come in and do to dance before the men and show off their beauty, right? So the queen refuses. Well, the women don't refuse, especially not an order from the king. And we can see the party comes to a rapid halt at the refusal of Vashti. The men are worried that if we allow this to go unpunished, 
then what are all the rest of the women going to do? Right? They're going to start refusing their husbands. Well, they decide and they look in the law and, and study the law and say, look, you've got one, two options, right? One is death and the other is banishment. Well, this is the wife of, this is the mother of his son, the future king, and death seems pretty harsh. And so he banishes her from his presence. She can never come before him again. He is lo she has lost grace from the king and stripped of her crown. And um, then some time passes, right? And usually after a fight between married couples, after a little bit of time and you look back and you think, you know, maybe... Maybe that wasn't quite such a big deal. Maybe it wasn't as big of a deal as I thought it was at the time. And, um, and he starts to miss her. And we read, we're in chapter 2 now, that after he, his anger had subsided, that he remembers her. And he misses her. Right? He misses having a queen. He misses having a wife. And the intention was that she would be replaced. But she hadn't been replaced to this point. We don't know how much time exactly has passed, but um, enough. And the men decide, the eunuchs there, say, hey, well, look, what we'll do is we'll gather a bunch of young, pretty women to come and display themselves before you and you can pick the best one and the best one and you can make her make her queen and the king liked that idea right a beauty pageant just for me and i get the prettiest and um so the women and are gathered and in the midst of gathering the women we learn about another character in this story right we learn about, first we learn about Mordecai, and Mordecai, who is a Jew, right, and the son of Kish, right, a descendant of Kish, a Benjamite. And this is important. Uh, sometimes we, when we're reading scriptures, we can pass over details like this. But that he's the son of Kish is an important detail in this story. Why? Who is Kish, right? Maybe that sounds vaguely familiar. Right? Kish was the father of a very important person in the history of Israel. He was the father of Saul. Right? Kish, the father of Saul, the first king of Israel. And so Mordecai is a descendant of the father of Saul. And he's a Benjamite. Now that will come back in later. So just keep, store that in your mind. Now, Mordecai's niece is Esther, and apparently Esther is a 10 plus. She is good looking. And as they're looking around this, the city in, in search of beautiful young women, she catches somebody's eye and is called in. And um, Esther appears to be... A, a very meek woman, a very obedient woman. She obeys Mordecai's command to, to not display openly her heritage as a Jew. Right? The Jews now have been in Persia for over a hundred years since their exile. And um, they've, they've gotten used to being there. I mean, we can think of uh, somebody whose heritage perhaps is from Mexico or from Latin America, but that's li been living in the U.S. for five or six generations. Frequently, those who are fifth or sixth generation Americans, they, they no longer speak their native tongues, right? They are completely, they've completely adapted now to this new culture. Now, maybe there still are some cultural heritages that are left, 
But even frequently we, especially if, uh, if there's no skin difference, we couldn't, we couldn't tell you if somebody, where they're from. We can't, I can't tell you, generally speaking, if somebody, oh, well, that's, he's Italian and that person's German and that other person, he's from Great Britain. But, uh, but their heritage is there, and she is Jewish, and, uh, but he says, you know, don't, don't, don't display that publicly. And so she obeys him and keeps that fact private. And Mordecai, Mordecai is a gatekeeper. This is basically like one of your guards for the city, opening and closing the gate, it wasn't an unimportant job, but it certainly wasn't one of the most important jobs either. They wanted trustworthy men there because they would have had access to the city and access to important places, but at the same time, this was not, this was not uh, one of your high officials. But Esther, as she comes in, she finds favor in the courts. She finds great favor there, and we see again her obedience as the eunuchs there who are in control of, the, of all of the women in the king's house. The kings didn't, in this day, have just one wife. They had many wives and many concubines. And, um, but, uh, and they were all these women were all under the authority of eunuchs who took care of them, who provided for them, who made sure they had what they needed. And well, the head of the eunuchs sees Esther and she finds favor with him. And she finds favor with all the other ladies. And we free that she found favor with all of them. And Esther was smart. She listened exactly to what their recommendations were. And we read they had a hundred, this is a year long beauty pageant, right? 180 days in baths of this type and another 180 days of, of other treatments to prepare them to be before the king. And, um, and she does exactly everything just like she's told. And you, the head eunuch, he knew what the king liked, right? And so when it was Esther's turn to go before the king, she did it, everything exactly as he told. She didn't take anything that he didn't tell her to take, and she didn't argue with him, right? And that turned out to be a wise decision because the king sees her and immediately falls in love with her and says, no more need for any of the rest. This is the one. And she's made queen in Vashti's place. Now enters into the story another man, right? We'll call him Evil Haman, right? Evil Haman, the first thing we read about him is that he is an Agagite. We're in chapter 3 now, 3 verse 1. An Agagite. Well, what in the world, what is an Agagite, right? This is the first and the only place we find Agagite is in the book of Esther, right? Well, if you know well the history of Israel, you know who Agag is. Agag was the king of the Amalekites. And you say, okay, who are the Amalekites, right? Well, the Amalekites have a history with Saul. The Amalekites were the nation that Samuel commanded Saul to destroy and to not take any of their plunder and to kill everyone, right? Well, Saul disobeys. If you remember the story, Saul disobeys. And what is the outcome? The outcome of Saul's disobedience is that he loses the kingdom of Israel, right? Right? He loses the kingdom of Israel because of this sin. And, then, and one more time, an Amalekite enters into the story of Saul. And it's towards the end, and Saul has just been in a battle and been wounded. And after being wounded in this battle, mortally, he's on the ground, and he sees a foreigner running by. 
And he says, hey, stop. Come by here and kill me. Right? Put me out of my misery. And this foreigner agrees. This foreigner was also an Amalekite. Right? So the Amalekites and the house of Saul have a very bad relationship with each other. There's a lot of bad blood. Because we're talking now 500 years later, right? And this is still in their minds. And so we read in verse 2 of chapter 3, right, that all the king's servants who were at the king's gate bowed down and paid homage to Haman. For so the king had commanded concerning him. But Mordecai neither bowed nor paid homage. Now, the Jews didn't generally have a problem with bowing down before a king to show them honor, right? There's lots of examples in the Bible, in the Old Testament, of Jews bowing before kings to pay them honor. Now, there would have been a problem with bowing before something or someone to worship them, but not to honor them, right? So now, why would Mordecai have such an issue with bowing down before this man, right? Mordecai, the descendant of Saul, and Haman, the descendant of Agag, right? Mordecai didn't like this guy from the very beginning, right? And Haman doesn't like the Jews from the very beginning. The Jews almost wiped out his people, And so, now with a little bit of the history, we can maybe understand, the Bible doesn't tell us, right? We don't, we don't read here exactly why he doesn't bow down, but we read the history, and we know what's there. So, Haman is furious. He cannot believe that this Jew will not bow down before him, Right? And in a fit of rage, Haman goes to the king, his buddy, and says, hey, let's wipe these people off the face of the earth. Not just Mordecai, right, but the whole Jewish realm, the whole, all of the Jews, let's get rid of them, right? And he just, he doesn't tell the king who he wants to get rid of. He just says, you know, there's this people and they don't listen to the laws of the king and we should get rid of them. And the king, who's kind of portrayed as uh, ambivalent at the best, uh, says, okay, gives the guy his ring, says, you do what you think is best. Haman was offering to pay for the endeavor, so sure, why not? And at this point, we enter chapter 4, which we read right, that Mordecai has learned about this uh, edict that has gone forth to destroy, to kill all the Jews in the kingdom. And there's great weeping, and he is mourning, and he comes to, Esther finds out about it, and she's trying to communicate with him, and She's asked by Mordecai to go before the king to plead for the life of the Jews. Well, Esther says, but look, you know, if I go to the king, it's not like I'm just real buddy-buddy with him that I talk to him all the time. It's been 30 days since I've even seen him. And he says, well, you need to go, right? And we read that Mordecai explains to Esther, look, you're not going to escape this edict. Now, maybe living in the palace, if nobody finds out that you're a Jew, you, will, you won't get killed right now, but it will come back to you eventually, right? And that if you don't step in now, we will, the Jews will find their deliverance. 
the Jews will find their deliverance from another place, and you will perish. And who knows if God, right, has not put you here in this place at this time. But we don't, we don't find God in the story here yet, right? Who knows if you haven't attained royalty for such a time as this? And so Esther replies, okay, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll go before the king. I'll risk my life and go before him, right? But I want you to fast three days. Three days, three nights, no food, nothing to drink either. Fast as we get ready for this. And so they fast. And now Esther goes to the king with a plan already in mind. She prepares a banquet. She prepares a first banquet for him. And in the anticipation of that maybe she's not going to die. And um, she goes into the court. And the king sees her and shows her mercy. And extends his scepter to her. And kings in this day, they are always, almost, they always would make grand offers, you know, anything you wish, even up to half my kingdom, right? Well, even today still in Arabic cultures, it's common to offer much more than what you would expect another person to accept, right? And uh, so if you ever find yourself with an Arab and they invite you to dinner, their expectation is that you're going to say no the first time they invite you. If they really want you to come, then they'll ask you again and again. Right? So he says, even up to half my kingdom, take it. And she says, just come to dinner. Right? And bring Haman, the prime minister. Bring him along with you. Right? Well, I want to talk business. And so he says, okay, let's go right now. He gets Haman, and they go over to Esther's place. She's got a dinner already planned out, prepared, set forth, and they have a nice dinner. And then after the dinner, he says again, okay, what do you want? Even up to half my kingdom. And she says, no, I don't need half your kingdom. Let's do dinner one more time tomorrow. I'll prepare dinner again, bring Haman along, and this time we'll really, we'll talk business, right? And he says, okay, tomorrow night it is. Well, Haman, on his way back home, who would he pass the gate except for Mordecai, right? Mordecai, this Jew who will not bow down before him, who will not show him honor. And he gets home and even he, he goes to his wife and his friends. He says, look, I have all this money, all this wealth. I have 10 sons. And all of this, I'm, I'm even the only person that Esther wanted to have dinner with the king. In all of this, it, makes, it doesn't even make me happy because of that Jew, Mordecai, right? And his wife and his friends say, then what are you doing? Just kill him, right? Set up a pole 75 feet high. Set it up in the air, a, a sharpened pole. And tomorrow ask the king and you can impale him on it. And that was the tradition in Persia. This was the precursor to the cross. And uh, so he says, you know what? You're right. I, there's no need for me to wait until we go to war to destroy all the Jews, which was going to be about a year away, a year's time, right? Because Haman, when he decided when they were going to destroy the Jews, he apparently was a very superstitious man, and he cast lots to decide what month and then what day. Right, and the month and day fell, and it was 11 months away. And Haman couldn't wait to kill Mordecai 
for another 11, 10, 11 months, that was, that was going to be too long. Right? So he, that night, has them put up this impaling pole, and he goes before the king early, right? Remember, not even Haman can just go before the king. The king has to call him, right? So Haman's waiting outside the king's door, hoping. Well, that night, the king couldn't sleep. And Mordecai, earlier in the story, Mordecai saved the king's life, right? The, the king, uh, he wasn't overly popular, right? And we know from history that it was later in another assassination attempt that was successful, which is how he died. And, uh, but there was a, an assassination attempt to kill King Xerxes. And Mordecai, at the door, he overhears a couple others talking about this and getting ready for an assassination attempt. So he had told Esther about this, and Esther informed the king, and they discovered the plot and put it to an end. Right? And it was all written down in this book of basically the king's daily journal log, if you will. What happened? And the king can't sleep. So he calls in a couple men and says, look, I can't sleep. Open up the log and just start reading. Well, they open up the log and they start reading. And they're reading about Mordecai, this gatekeeper of the king's who saved his life. And the king says, well, wait, what... Did we honor this man? What did we do for him? And the eunuch says, nope, we didn't do anything. There's nothing written down here. And so the king says, okay, well, is, it, is there anybody outside? And Haman's there, right? Haman's there waiting for the king, hoping that he's going to be called soon because he wants to have Mordecai killed. Well, the king has other plans at this point. He calls in Haman and says, Haman, what should I do for somebody I want to honor? And Haman says, wow, well, who does the, would the king want to honor but me, right? I mean, I'm the best guy around. And so he says, hmm, what would I like? Well, you know what I'd really like is to be king for a day. So I think what you should do is you should dress up the guy in king's robes and put him on the king's horse and have one of the highest officials in the whole country go out before him and say, this is what the king does to the man he wants to honor, right? And the king says, great, do it for Mordecai. Well, you can imagine Haman's distress. He just built an impaling pole to put this guy on, right? And is coming in to ask to have him impaled. And the king says, well, now I want you to go forth before the whole city and proclaim the greatness of this man. This man who will not honor you, I want you to honor, right? And he does it reluctantly, but he does it. It's the order of the king. And then runs home, right, like a little child, weeping and wailing in mourning, and gets home and recounts everything to his friends and his wife again. And this time, his friends, these are the same friends that yesterday said you should impale him. Today they say, you know what? You're out of luck. This guy, he's, he's a Jew, and now, you know, I'm remembering all these stories about Jews and how things have happened for them over the years, and there is nothing you can do. You're doomed, right? And in the midst of this discussion, he's swept away. The king's eunuchs come for him, say, it's time, dinner time. 
right? So he gets swept away, goes to Esther's place. I imagine he feels very differently than he did the day before. And during the dinner, you know, they have dinner, and after dinner, again, the king asks, okay, tell me for real now, what do you want? Even up to half the kingdom, it's yours, right? And Esther says, look, if it, my people had been asked just to be, if they had just been turned into slaves, I wouldn't have come before you, right? But somebody has issued an edict to kill all of my people. And the king says, what? Who? Who would have done such a thing? And Esther points squarely at him. This man, Haman, he's the one. And the king stands up and a furious rage marches out. Haman, you can imagine, he sees where this is going. And he falls before Esther to say, please spare my life. I didn't know. I didn't know that you were a Jew. Right? And the king comes in right as Haman is falling down before her and says, are you going to assault my wife even while I'm standing here? So at that moment, they put a bag over his head and they march him out. And then somebody comes in and he says, you know what? You know the guy all day, you know, today, been marching around the city, this guy Mordecai. You've been having his honor proclaimed in the streets. Last night, Haman built an impaling pole for him. Right? So the king, what does he say? Well, impale Haman on it. Right? So Haman's put to death. Well, in the Persian Empire, you couldn't just reverse a law that had gone out. Right? So this law that had gone out with the king's seal to kill the Jews, to get together, to destroy them all, in about a year's time, stands firm. And Esther goes back to the king and says, What can we do? What can we do? Well, the king says, look, and she is told, the king at this point, who Mordecai is, that he basically acted like her father because Esther's parents had died. He says, you and Mordecai get together, write whatever law you want. But remember, I can't undo the law that's already been put out. And so they get together and they put a law together that says, we are going to defend ourselves as Jews, right? We are going to defend ourselves from our enemies. So on the same day that was going to take place, the destruction of the Jews, you are now going to get all the help you need from Mordecai, who now has all the wealth of Haman. You're going to get all the help you need from the palace officials. You can imagine the palace officials at this point are scared of Mordecai, right? They see what how the tables changed just in the course of a day, right? He went from being a doorkeeper to being the owner, essentially, of all of Haman's property and a trusted official before the king. So all the other officials are now scared of Mordecai as well. And they're all offering their own help in this matter to help protect the Jews, and so the edict goes out. And on the day the Jews were all to die, the tables, as we read, are turned. And instead of the destruction of the Jews, we have the destruction of their enemies. And the Jews were told that they were allowed to take the plunder of any of their enemies who would attack them. Right? But we also read in the scriptures that it says they didn't touch the plunder. Right? They didn't touch the plunder. It wasn't a matter of trying to accumulate the wealth of others, right? They were just trying to defend themselves. 
And we read that 500 were killed in Susa in the capital. So 500 were still crazy enough, even though Mordecai lives there, right, and has now all the wealth and power of the king behind him to try and attack the Jews still, right? And they fail miserably. And throughout the whole kingdom, it's the same story. People are trying to attack the Jews that are their enemies, but they fail. And so there is a great celebration, which is known today as Purim, and is still celebrated among the Jews to this day. Now, sometimes this celebration has gotten out of hand among the Jews. There's a lot of drunkenness today when it comes to this celebration, but, uh, but we, don't, we don't read that in, in the scriptural story of this celebration. So, what's going on here? It's a, it's a great story, right? But even as I, I recounted and I tried and I slipped up once, right, not to use God, right? Because he's not there in the story, right? He's not there, and yet he's everywhere. Right? He's not there explicitly, yet he's in the whole thing. So even though his name isn't mentioned, the closest they get is to talk about fasting, right? But never does it say they prayed. Surely they prayed. Right? What else would they be doing during three days of fasting but praying? Right? And it says that in, the whole, in the whole world, the Jews were fasting. But it doesn't say they were praying, right? But certainly they were, right? They were entreating God. But the storyteller wants to get across a point. Sometimes, even though we don't see God directly, he's still there. Even though we don't see him explicitly, he's there. God stories. God stories are some of my favorites, right? So I was at Texas A&M University my freshman year. I was struggling with my relationship with God at the time. And I remember the beginning of the second semester, no, the end of the first semester, reflecting on how the semester had gone. And I was thinking, God, I really need something. I don't know what it is I need, but I need something. And I'm sitting, in, I'm sitting in my room, I can still remember, I'm sitting in my room, I'm praying, God, I need something. And then my phone rings. I pick it up, hello? And it's this guy, Chris Segrist, a good friend of mine now, and he says, I got your name from a friend of mine who got it from your father and said you might be interested in a Bible study. And... Uh, I said, well, you know, yeah. Actually, I was just praying for you to call me. <laughs> but uh, in life, we can see God. Even, I didn't hear an audible voice of God, but I still knew that he was doing something, right? Even when we lose our keys or our phone, we say, I don't have $200 to buy another phone, or three or four, or however much the phone costs. Right? We say, God, where is my phone? And then you find it. Right? And we say, well, I was looking for it. Right? So I was going to find it either which way. Right? Or when Libby and myself, we were in Mexico. And Libby had a miscarriage, and it forced us to reevaluate a little bit of where we were in the time and the place. And as we were evaluating, we started to pray. Uh, we were uh, counseled by the pastor of our home church in Dallas to um, 
to start looking, see, see what open doors there are. And we send out, I sent out my interview to dozens of places, didn't hear back from anybody. I sent my interview, I'm, my resume, um, we had seen RGBI, and I sent my resume to them thinking, well, I'm not sure about this place, but maybe. And um, I sent it to him, and within like 30 minutes, he called me back. It was like, what are you, what are you, you know, would you be interested in coming up for, for an interview? you know? And, uh, well, RGBI at the time was in desperate need of two different roles. One was somebody who could help with accounting, and I'm a CPA, and one who could, uh, could work in the missions department at RGBI, and I have a master's degree in missions, right? And so he saw this and was like, there it is. <laughs> Right? God at work in our lives. We've been called for such a time as this. Right? This church in this place in this city at this time is here for a reason. Right? God orchestrates events and he doesn't normally speak to us in audible voices. Right? But the timing that he has is so clear, right? His timing is perfect. He times events so that kings can't sleep and read stories to save a man's life, right? God's timing is incredible. And we say, well, you know, Esther was placed in, the, was in her place. You know, she was the queen, of course, Right? But Mordecai was in his place for a reason too. And he was just a doorkeeper. But God had him in the right place at the right time. God has us in our places for a purpose. Right? He has us in our neighborhoods for a purpose. He has us looking for jobs or in our jobs for a purpose. We are called, we have been called by him for a reason. Discovering that reason is not always the easiest. Sometimes we don't know for years why God has us go for, through something. I certainly did not understand why Libby would have had to have a miscarriage. And it didn't make sense, right? But now, being here in this place and holding Robert, it makes so much sense. And that's not to say that the miscarriage was a good thing, it was an evil thing, right? But God works things together. He works them together for good. And he places us in situations and he desires us to follow after him wholeheartedly. Are we doing what we should be doing? Are we as a church, as a body of Christ, proclaiming his name, showing our love to each other in such a way that others see it? and know how much we love one another and are drawn to him? Do people in our workplaces see that? Does the relationships with our spouses, with our siblings, with our friends, does it reflect that? We have been called for such a time as this right now in the midst of of wars in the Middle East, government shutdowns, a country which seems to be morally losing its grip, accepting gay marriage. We have been called for such a time as this. This is also the world which we are closer than ever 
to reaching every unreached people group on this planet, closer than we ever have been before. Evangelical Christians are growing at a greater percentage than they ever have before. The gospel is advancing faster than it ever has before. We have been called for this time. God has placed each one of us here for this time. And we need to ask ourselves, what is my purpose in God's plan right now? God bless.